Hello everybody and welcome to today's episode. So for today I figured we'd talk about you know something that may not be particularly important given our circumstances. As you all know, we're currently in the middle of a pandemic worldwide. It affects pretty much most of the planet, I would say, if not all of the planet. And I can see it lasting for a while, which means that, you know, our logistics need to plan for that. And, and having been through very similar situations in the past, uh, unfortunately, I can tell you that logistics and liability are the same thing. The better your logistical planning is as an institution, uh, the less liability you will incur at the individual level. And that's ultimately what institutions should plan for. It's maximal ownership of the situation. So today I figured we'd talk about some of the aspects of both uh, that we need to bear in mind uh, as the situation evolves. And listen, like with all of these talks, um, I recently prepared one for the operating room, which I'm hoping to share uh, very soon. I'm just giving it at a couple of teleconferences at the moment. One for uh, personal protective equipment variations and the nuances of mask versus respirator. All of these things are evolving on a daily basis. Like, I have to revise a talk literally once a day. And that just tells you how much work is being invested worldwide to try and solve the problem. And it's actually quite admirable, you know. It's, it's pretty amazing what I'm seeing around the world. But just to stick to today's topic, so... There are three big issues that, that need to be addressed. The first is the fact that with uh, the boomer population um, being at risk uh, or identified as at risk, although the situation seems to be evolving rather quickly and it's becoming more of a general population issue, they've been identified as at risk. And with uh, social isolation being a key component of flattening the curve, as they put it, uh, and improving overall outcomes at a nationwide level, it come, stands to reason that we're going to learn have to learn how to address uh, patient care remotely, possibly with telehealth. And that has its own limitations, both in terms of logistics and planning, right? The next is uh, cross-infection rates. So we need to minimize cross-infection when the patients are in-house, whether it's in the OPD or outpatient clinic, whether it's in surgery in the operating room, which I'm hoping to talk about soon as well, or whether it's just plain old at home, right? Uh, coming in and visiting family members. All these things have to be taken into account and they have to be addressed at an institution level. And then there has to be a decision for upsurge capacity at an institution level and at the level of volunteers that are coming in. And, and that's something that I think we need to address with a sense of urgency because I can see it becoming one of the first things that we we would have to look for legally, and I'll explain why in a second. So the sources for this talk are extremely limited. I talk to people at protection uh, societies and malpractice insurers or liability insurers. I've looked at legal directives of the local hospitals here, and I've talked to our legal department locally here in Kuwait, as well as departments in uh, Europe and in the States and Canada. And at the, this moment in time, I have yet to hear about one lawsuit being filed. And, and that just tells you the urgency of the situation, right? Uh, everybody's in this together, and so therefore, liability has been put aside. But, I can, but everybody I talk to, what's interesting is, they could come up with scenarios where it could be a problem. And that's what I'm hoping to talk about today. It's a very limited, uh, opinion-based, discussion-based type of situation. And Hopefully, I'll eventually be able to have live discussions with you guys. So first, let's deal with the possibility of telehealth becoming the norm and remote medical management. That poses a couple of problems and a couple of logistical issues, let's say. So the, the first is when to use it. I mean, do we use it for follow-ups? Do we use it for consent for surgeries and procedures that are to be done? Can we use it for medication renewals and only those things? Should we be automating this situation so that when we renew the medication, the patient has direct access to it? Should there be an all-inclusive package, like uh, some EMRs are, are trying to, to put up? Or should it be a, a, a dedicated telehealth standard or guideline? Should we be offering courses for it, describing the limitations of it? And where should it not be used? 
Should it not be used if somebody, say, is uh, having chest pain or if somebody is having a certain psychiatric condition? I know that telehealth has been used extensively in psychiatry, but are there limitations to this that we should consider, particularly considering how difficult it will be to gain access to support as social isolation becomes a problem? And social isolation will add to the stressor of the event. Sociologically, it's been studied. I have yet to see a psychiatrist comment on the issue. But sociologically, social isolation does change dynamics, certainly, and changes the, the way that the pathologies manifest. And I find it extremely, extremely, extremely important to have these discussions early, right? And then you must ensure that there's access to further testing, right? So uh, if, if you're going to order a CBC or Chem 7 or a UNE uh, or whatever else you want to call it, Chem 9, or urea and electrolytes, or routine blood panels preoperatively, um, how can you ensure that the patient knows how to access it and can access it safely so that there is no cross-infection risk? That has to be factored in. Then there has to be the security of the platform. And if the platform does leak information, where does it leak to? How, how does the use of an intermediary, such as a service for telehealth, uh, impede or empower patients? You know, uh, should patients be allowed to record what we're saying, the videos, right? And then last but certainly not least, should there be a consent or a disclaimer before using a telehealth platform? Should this disclaimer be signed by us uh, and the patient? Should the disclaimer come up at, with every single patient encounter? Should it be a fine print situation or like that agree that you hit with iTunes? I know that iTunes is now defunct, but that agree that you hit when you're installing your new Mac OS. Um, you know, these discussions, I think, should happen, and they should happen early, and we should be comfortable with having them as an institution, right? Last but certainly not least, where do we document? Is the video that we're recording enough of a documentation? Should we be documenting in the chart? And how do we bill this? I know that in the U.S. the billing isn't an issue, but in other countries you can't legally bill unless it's a face-to-face -face conversation, right? These discussions have to happen, and they have to happen early because we could be in this for the long haul. When you document, it should never be just the encounter details. It should be why it was a telehealth encounter. Is it because it was an institutional policy? Is it because of restrictions in terms of the bookings that you have? There has to be a rationale there, right? Then there has to be instructions for when the patient should come into hospital, if it's a new thing. Even if it's an old thing, it should be reinforced that the patient should come in with ample time ahead. The patient should recognize the limitations of the testing process, which we'll talk about in a second. And then we need to make sure that the patient gets the documentation that they need. Are we going to email it? What time limit is there to email it? Who is it going to be delegated to within your practice? And then you have to plan the next follow-up. Is it going to be an in-person follow-up? Is there a minimum number of in-person follow-ups that we should be adhering to for more frequent patients? These discussions have to happen early. I'm lucky in that most of my practice is now acute care and mainly academic, right? But... In this particular instance, I'm lucky. Most days I'm not. But in this particular instance, I'm lucky. But for people who have regular patients that they need to follow up for nutritional issues, post-bariatric surgery, for people who have patients who they need to follow up because the patient requires constant care, for patients who need to be in contact with doctors for psychiatric illnesses and are now feeling the stress of social isolation, these discussions have to happen early. And, you know, I would say they should have happened earlier than where we are right now, even if it were at all possible, but I doubt that anybody has the time or had the time to predict the, the current situation. The next logistical problem is the cost infection risk. Now, all around the world, you're getting these guidelines about how to organize your operating room versus your ICU versus your outpatient clinic. These guidelines begin with having the stakeholders in one group or in one room. Uh, I would su strongly suggest that you use teleconferencing at this point. So this should include administrative representatives and experts at it. Engineering people, infection control people, the treating team themselves, and the people responsible for the screening process in your institution. I'm sure by now most institutions have a COVID-19 screening process. They should be involved in the conversation. And then all your conversation that you've had should be documented in a clear step-by-step -step policy or protocol that can be signed and run through the legal um, representatives of your institution. Administratively, the key questions are, 
how should you plan and space out appointments? Now, in certain places where I practice, this has become um, a legal mandate by the Ministry of Health. And I think that there's extreme wisdom there. Like, I have to say, the Ministry of Health here in Kuwait have performed a phenomenal job at dealing with these logistical aspects. It's it's just it's amazing to see. I, I'm I'm extremely proud of the work that's happening all around me, and it's just it's it's amazing the 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 level of detail that they're going through and and, and the sense of team dynamic. It's just uh, you would have thought that we've been doing this forever, just the way that people have this this almost casual expertise with the current situation. I, I would call it the casual expertise at this point. So spacing at the appointments for all outpatient clinics, operations, etc. Limiting certain clinics that we don't really need. So we may not need an aesthetic clinic necessarily. We may not need, a, 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 a not to disrespect anybody, but we may not need dental clinics apart from the dental emergency clinic at this moment in time. Right? These things should be deferred. And it's safer for your patients, it's safer for your practice, and it's safer for your workers. Uh, and that's the truth. And I'll hopefully be doing a talk on risk factors for healthcare workers involved in, in COVID-19 treatment. There's a lot of data coming out recently. And then there should be a talk at an administrative level of which practices can be transitioned to a telehealth platform, either partially or completely. For example, psychiatry, I think, may be of great help for people if it was a telehealth platform that they could access confidentially, right? In terms of your engineering, the geographic spacing, for example, having chairs one meter apart in the waiting room, having appropriate uh, cleaning apparatus available, uh, such as uh, alcohol, basins, etc., having storage areas put in a manner that does not allow for cross-infections to occur or minimizes them, at least geographically, right? and restricting the number of waiting patients and the geographic size of the waiting area. Provision of segregated doorways for at-risk groups and service entrances to be reallocated for patients who may be at risk. And then having a sewage and bio waste system that is segregated or that in some way protects the rest of the hospital. These engineering aspects may not be important legally, but they're important logistically, right? I always say you need to buy your engineer a cup of coffee once a week at least. And the reason why is because they may not be implicated directly because their name isn't on the billboard, right? But they're literally the engine that makes you run. The only reason why you can perform surgery is because somebody put the light in the right place and made sure that it will work every single time. The only reason why the suction keeps working so well is because somebody calculated the exact amount that you needed and how the length of piping and diameter would affect you. These things, they're engineering issues. Converting rooms to negative pressure isolation rooms like we talked about earlier in, in the uh, ICU talk, extremely important, right? So get to know your engineers and get them working on this as part of your plan to reduce cross-infection rates. In terms of screening, it has to be simple, but it has to be direct. There have to be a list of symptoms involved. I'm sure that most of you know them by now. Uh, severe non-remitting cough, spiking fever, lethargy, aches and pains, severe GI symptoms such as diarrhea, nausea and vomiting, a recent travel, recent contact with somebody who's uh, COVID-19 positive, and many, many others that I'm not going to go through today because, you know, we've already been through them, but you can look them up. And then a method. What do we do with these patients physically? Do we call the infection control team? Is there a dedicated screening team for us to call if we encounter them in other parts of the hospital? For example, postoperatively, right? And then confirmation logistics. If I have a question of COVID-19 in a patient, right, and they're planned for, say, a mastectomy, how do I do that? How do I arrange for that? How do I screen for that? Do I just do routine PCR? Do I do PCR and the current immunoglobulin that's coming into the market, uh, IgG-based ones and IgM-based ones? Or do I do a screening CT scan, which has been advocated for in certain institutions? I know in Italy, in the Humanitas Hospital, uh, they're currently advocating for that because you simply can't stop cancer care, right? The show must go on. Uh, these are patients who are very sick and have been waiting quite a while for their surgery. And the timing of their surgery is extremely important. But how do you do it safely? And again, that's a conversation that needs to be happening as part of the team with the treating team involved. 
And that brings us to the treating team. Your treating team needs to understand their precautions, the restrictions on their practice. So what surgeries they can't do and can't do, what bronchoscopies they can do and can't do, what GI procedures they can do and can't do, interventional procedures, which patients should they be seeing, and how are they going to plan for time off if part of their team ends up being corona positive. You've seen representatives in the U.S. government. We've seen celebrities. We've seen everybody turn up corona positive. Not everybody, but an extremely large amount of people in the public eye. And we need to address that concern for the sake of continuity of care, for which we might be liable. And then we need to decide if we're going to be training them to help us out as part of the COVID team and when to do it. Which brings us to the infection control guru. So infection control, I do in occupational health. Listen, I have a very wide skill set, but I'm going to be honest here. Before this whole thing blew up, I didn't know what I was talking about. I bought the engineer a cup of coffee because that's the right thing to do. And then I bought all these guys coffees. And I sat down with them and they explained it to me. And you know why? Because they get it. Ultimately, your ID guy is the shawl caller, right? And they understand the organizational aspect. They've been trained to do this, like you and I have been trained to do ACLS, ATLS, and dynamic resuscitation, right? As resuscitationists, intensivists, anesthetists, and surgeons who work in trauma, we're so slick at this stuff, it's not even funny. But these guys, they're slick at this stuff, at the corona stuff, okay? So leave it up to them. Make sure that they know that you need them to organize stuff, to come up with a deployment plan for everybody, to stock the equipment and tell you if there's a stock problem, and education of the rest of the team. And they need to be involved with augmenting your overall care plan. Now, I will be talking about that when I talk about the operating room a little bit, but they need to be around to deal with your care plan. And, and that's key, right? They need to be able to augment it. And this has to happen with a consensus of your stakeholders. And when I say consensus, I don't mean that you all agree. I mean that you all document that you agree. So there has to be a guideline, a policy, or a protocol. And the reason why is, as we upsurge and as we scale up, confusion will occur. Right? We've all had chaotic codes. So this is an institutional version of a chaotic code. And what you don't want to happen is institutional panic because nothing was documented and people have mixed messages. Everything has to be clear and succinct. And that's imperative. There's no way out of it. Now, about upsurge capacity. So unfortunately, we're already seeing shortages around the world of equipment, of able staff, of uh, beds, of ventilators. We're already seeing it. And, and, you know, it's a tough thing to see. We need to recognize this is not like your typical disaster event. Typically, when we deal with mass casualties and disasters, we tend to think of them as sprints, right? You have 10 patients coming in uh, every 15 to 20 minutes, maximum one hour. You're going to have an incoming a triage, a secondary triage, a tertiary triage. Your patients are going to be triaged mainly for surgical versus non-surgical care and going to be placed in a monitored setting as they are required and de-escalated accordingly. So you have an initial jump that drops significantly. And this whole cycle can happen for a day, maximum five days. The most I've ever been in terms of a crunch is five days. What we're dealing with here is up to three, four, five, six months of escalation before the curve flattens. And I'm going to be honest, I was never trained for this. I was never trained to be cognizant of a slow progressive rise in patient care and resource allocation and shortages, right? And, you know, when these things occur, you're going to need to rely on outside expertise because it's an extremely unique situation. And that has its own logistical problems and liabilities that occur with it. Similarly with pooling workers, we're eventually going to have a shortage of nurses, a shortage of physician assistants, a shortage of doctors, and we're going to need to help each other out. But how do we do it safely? In terms of resource allocation, you're going to need to have daily crisis plans and situational reports from the active areas that are involved, which, based on what I'm seeing, are the ICU, the emergency department, the infection control, ID team, an occupational team, and IM team. These should not just be debriefs and lists of patients. 
there should be lists of what's available, lists of what's going short, and have a cutoff. When we're down to 50% of our supply, I need to know. It's not 25 anymore. It's 50%. Because worldwide, there are shortage of N95 masks, and we know it. There are shortages of swabs for diagnostic purposes, and we know it. And for us to be able to provide that care adequately and slickly, like I'm seeing here in Kuwait, if only it was just a financial issue. It's a logistical and transport nightmare. You have to be so ahead of the game that you have to know that there's going to be a shortage coming in when you're at 50% minimum, right? And what I'm seeing is impossible for, I've never thought, you know, it's impossible for you to predict what, what's happening all around us, right? You need to have that stuff ready. And it needs to be ready early. And you need to know when you're at 50% and you need to order in. And you need to end every single meeting with a discussion about the ethical concerns. Because these heads of departments that are currently running the show, they need to have a, a time to decompress. And nobody understands the pressure that they're on. Nobody. Nobody. Whenever I've had to be the clinical triage officer, nobody really understood what my concerns were. They, they had a sort of feeling uh, of that I, I was frustrated or I was getting frustrated or something like that. But they never understood why? And I don't think I did, to be completely honest, until I had time to talk to a friend who, who understood or, or who was in the same boat. And that helps a lot, just having been through similar situations. It helps a lot to have that discussion about ethical concerns after every meeting. Now, when you talk about pools of expertise, right now we have a glorious amount of information sharing worldwide, right? But you need to document why you use that piece of information what the source is, and you need to validate the source, and the rationale. We're going to start getting external consulting, right? Whenever somebody comes in to help you out, there has to be a discussion about their legal coverage and licensing and their liability. And then whatever discussions you have, you need to decide on whether or not they're just as valid in your institution as they are in others. This will begin as meetings. These meetings need to be documented. They need to be documented, number one, so that everybody in your, in your institution gets to join in and, and benefit from the discussions. And number two, so that there is a consensus documented. And number three, for liability issues. Okay? But, you know, if you're going to have external consulting, there has to be a liability discussion. Next is the pool of workers. Now, you have three big funds. Right? You have pending graduates and residents. You have those of us who have retired recently in terms of nursing, physician assistants, uh, surgeons, anesthetists, pathologists, etc., uh, intensivists. And you have people who have pivoting roles. So EMTs who have to act like nurses given shortages. RTs who have to transition towards anesthesia techs or vice versa. And physician assist assistants extending their capacity within the healthcare uh, infrastructure. You need to recognize your legal and ethical duties, the preparation of your knowledge base, and the limitations of your current expertise. You know, and, and it's tough, man, because these things, they're not high on the list when you're trying to be the hero. But they're important to understand. And I don't mean that in a condescending fashion. I mean that innately, in the sense that it's innate for us to want to help. It's not innate for us to think about What's the easiest, best, and safest way for me to prepare so that when I'm called, I can help? You know, and, and I think that that difference needs to be recognized. So in terms of preparation, you need to work on your uh, licensing. So if you're pending graduation, there's a lot of countries and institutions that will give you a temporary license now. And you might want to try and explore that option and what's required for it. If you're pending graduation or pending your uh, Royal College exam or your final barrier exam towards being certified as a specialist in your field. You need to attend in-house training in the institution that you're thinking of working in to familiarize yourself with their own personalized protocols and to familiarize yourself with the staff that you'll be working with. You need to activate or reactivate your current licensing and you need to speak to a liability provider or liability insurance provider or malpractice provider to make sure that you have legal coverage for when you get back in the field, right? And I would recommend that you do it today because eventually we're all going to rely on you. And I mean this in the frankest sense of the word. I'm being completely frank and honest here. 
we need you, we're going to need you. Everything up to this point points to the fact that we're going to need you. We're going to get through this, but we're going to need you. For you to be useful, you need to be licensed, you need to be legal, and you need to be up to date. Possibly more up to date than we are on the field, right? And you need to be able to be safe and have malpractice insurance so that you don't land in trouble later on. When you first get started, if it's been a while since you've been working in a hospital, observe, learn, team up with people who you already know and are familiar with because you've attended in-service meetings, and ask the right questions at the right time. Now, globally, not just people who are coming back to work, but globally, worldwide, I'm hearing lots of stories about difficult decisions having to be made in terms of triaging and prioritizing patient care, who goes where, how to split ventilation, etc., my advice is to document clearly the clinical details of the situation that you're in and the rationale for your decision and see if it will be backed up by your institution. It can only be one line. I know that you don't have enough time and things are getting very busy, but it should be documented. If you got exposed to a COVID-19 positive patient or a corona patient as a healthcare worker, I'm going to go through this in greater detail when I talk about risk factors, etc. But you need to document it. You need to inform your supervisors. You need to find adequate replacement. And then you need to stay at home and possibly get tested. If you do develop enough symptoms to be hospitalized, yes, you need to be hospitalized. Now, the question becomes, when do you come back to active work? Nobody has a clear answer to that. There's no clear consensus at this moment in time. So I can't give you an answer, and I don't want to make one up. Remember, we're all in this together. Um, start planning for these things early. Uh, thank you for listening, and please subscribe. And please use these, uh, these talks, by all means.